Welcome back to Matt's Movie Nights. We, we finished a, a full year of movie nights. Um, and uh, our last triple feature was guest curated by Mr. Quentin Tarantino. The, the butterscotch beer is still sitting here from uh, my Aliens vs. Titanic review. Which may or may not be out when this comes out. Hopefully it's out. It should be out. Can you tell I filmed this back-to-back -back with that? I like to do all my filming in one day. Quite often I will film more than one video in a day. So I think uh, to start off with, I should talk about this DVD triple feature um, brought to us by Mr. Quentin Tarantino for a brief time in the early 2000s. Uh, Miramax gave Quentin Tarantino his own little distribution label to, re well, release whatever he wanted. I was going to say release old stuff, but he released some new stuff through it, too. It was, it was Rolling Thunder Pictures was the name. Weirdly, never did a release of the film Rolling Thunder, which is clearly what it's named after. But, uh... They, they did releases, they did some re-releases of, like, old exploitation films, and they also released a couple new movies. Um, Hardcore Logo, I know, was one, and I think there was some, like, Mexican movie that Tarantino was a producer on that they also released. Um, and, and mostly they just did, like, old stuff. And that... That sort of got discontinued after, like, a dozen or so titles. But then, in the lead-up to uh, the Grindhouse double feature, Tarantino and uh, Robert Rodriguez's Grindhouse double feature, they got Tarantino to curate a, a three-picture, like, exploitation triple feature. Grindhouse triple feature. See the action, feel the passion, triple feature presentation. Uh, and the first film we watched in the set was The Mighty Peking Man, a, a Hong Kong movie from the uh, early 70s? Actually, it might have been 77. Hold on. 77, yeah. So the late 70s, actually. Um, clearly a King Kong cash-in, ca like, rip-off, I guess. Eh, cash-in. Clearly very strongly inspired by King Kong, and I guess probably the Dino De Laurentiis King Kong, which was... Because that, that's what was popular in the 70s. Although I don't think that film was super popular, but there were a bunch of rip-offs of it, so maybe it was. Mighty P. King Man is definitely better than Dino De Laurentiis King Kong. I, I can say that with absolute certainty. I love Mighty Peking Man. <laughs> Much like uh, Silent Night, Deadly Night, this was a film my friend James and I started watching sort of with the expectation that it would be a bad movie, but then we ended up really liking it. And obviously Mighty Peking Man we enjoyed a little more ironically than uh, Silent Night, Deadly Night, <laughs> but uh, it's... I mean, it's really fun. It knows exactly what it's doing. And there's a lot of effort put into it. Like, they, they have scenes in this movie with live animals. And that impresses me. <laughs> like, that's not something you expect out of, like, some low-budget King Kong ripoff. But it's like, nope, they've got, they like, an actual leopard. Uh, and there's, like, fight scenes with the leopard. There's a scene where the girl swings the leopard around, which seems unsafe. Um, but, you know, it's... I mean, they, they had a live train, trained animals on the set. More than one, multiple trained animals. And so I, I give them props for that. A lot of movies would not have that. Yeah, there's just a lot of heart, a lot of effort put into this. And it's just so fucking fun. It's so enjoyable. This is the story of... Uh, the main character, I guess, is Johnny. Who's, like, he... His, 
he just found out his girlfriend's cheating on him. He's real down. And uh, these explorers come to him because he's like, you know, this nature survival man. And they want to go out into the jungle because there's a rumor that the ancient Peking man, uh, you know, one of our, like, ape ancestors lives out there. Now, I'm no expert on evolution, but I'm pretty sure our ape ancestors were not, like, 40 feet tall. That seems wrong. But what do I know? So anyways, they, they go into the jungle and most of them die before they ever get to where Peking Man is. And then, like, after one too many animal attacks, the few people who are left sort of cut and run, leaving Johnny by himself. Um, and he ends up meeting this girl, Samantha, uh, who is, like, kind of Tarzan-ish. Her, her parents' plane crash-landed, and she escaped, but her parents died. So she's been raised in the jungle, and she sort of knows... She, she, she's in touch with all the local animals, including the mighty Peking man. She, she is like his, I don't know, like pet owner or something. Like she, she can control the Peking man. Like if he gets out of hand, she'll step in and be like, oh no, don't do that. She has a name for him. And I can't think of what it is. My God. So anyway, uh, Johnny, like, he, he becomes really close with Samantha, and he convinces her to let him bring Peking Man to the city. But then when they get to the city, they basically just put Peking Man in this giant cage and, and like, like chase him around for sport. You know, they have... It's, you know, it's King Kong. It's like, ooh, look at the giant fucking monster, and isn't it scary? And then he escapes and is rampaging around town looking for the girl he likes. Yeah, so very King Kong in that manner, but still uh, original enough that I enjoy it. It's got its fun moments. Like, more than enough to make up for the fact that it is... Just a King Kong ripoff. I have a, a lot to say about this woman's, like, animal leather top. Because for starters, it seems like they couldn't agree on how nude they were willing to let her be. Because there's a lot of scenes where, like, half her nipples just hanging out. You can just see that thing. But there are other scenes where it seems like they've, like, glued the leather down over her nipples so there won't be any nudity because like it's it's standing up in this awkward way that like real cloth would not like real cloth would just fall over and show off her nipple and this seems stuck up to her chest so they they couldn't agree on how nude they were willing to let this character be but then there's this particularly strange scene where johnny buys her like human clothes to wear and she like reaches back and like unhooks her leather top like it's a bra it's like excuse me isn't that like animal hide why is there a bra strap on the back of your animal hide where did you get a bra strap from but then he's like oh you know a human women in in normal society uh, we wear they wear dresses but the thing he got her is this, like, skimpy leather fetish gear. And it's like, that's not a dress, Johnny. What are you... That's not something she should really wear out. You know, unless she's gonna be like a dominatrix at a leather bar. This is not really an appropriate outfit. <laughs> like, how is this more appropriate than the animal skins she came in? So, so there's, like, the scene where Johnny finds his girlfriend cheating on him. Um, like, it's, it's sort of a flashback. Like, they're in the jungle, and it's like, oh, man, what happened to you? And then you get, like, a flashback to him walking in on his 
girlfriend with like his brother or his friend, one of those things. And the guy's just like, oh, I swear, it, like me and her, it just started as a joke. And I'm like, wait, is he, you fucked his girlfriend as a joke? Like, like, don't worry, dude, I only fucked your girlfriend ironically. It's just a prank, bro. It's just a prank. <laughs> it's the weirdest fucking excuse I have ever heard. And I, it should be clear, King Kong is not the only thing they took inspiration from in this movie. Clearly, Samantha is a very Tarzan-ish character. Um, reminds me a lot of Sheena the Jungle Queen. That's a movie I really need to talk about. That's right here. Sheena the Jungle Queen, movie I really need to talk about. Such a... Such a weird movie. Ah, <laughs> uh, ah, uh, Mighty Peking, man. I love it. I adore it. It's so good. <laughs> uh, the monkey costume's not great, but it's not, like, that much worse than what was in Dino De Laurentiis' King Kong, so... Yeah, I don't know. It's uh, a fun little movie. I, I really enjoyed Mighty Peking, man. Um, highly, c comes highly recommended by me. Uh, next up we watched The Switchblade Sisters. Just sort of this, uh, youth in revolt movie. So that there's like this gang, and then they have like a second separate associated gang, which is for like their girlfriends and stuff. It's all, all, there's, so there's like the guy gang and then the girl gang. And they run this school, but then, you know, one of the rival schools across town is shutting down. So the gang that ran that school is now coming to their school. And it, it becomes this big turf war to try to take over the school. Well, the leader of the guy's gang gets killed. And so the new girl, Maggie, sort of takes on this, like, take charge attitude. Like, come on, we gotta, like get together and then stop those guys and, you know, the guy gang is sort of unwilling to go through with it. So she goes, fuck y'all, we're starting our own girl gang. Get the fuck out. So they rename the girl gang the Jezebels and they get to work, you know, finding a way to win this turf war. Except the, the uh, head of the guy's gang, the, like the Dagger brothers, Dagger... The Daggers, maybe? Just the Daggers? Something about Daggers, because the girl gang was the Dagger Debs. Anyway, the, the leader of uh, the the Dagger gang, uh, his girlfriend was, like, super jealous of, like, him and the new girl Maggie, um, even though there's kind of not really anything between them. I don't know. He, like tries he like comes on to her and she kind of turns him down and it's kind of implied that maybe he raped her but maybe he just left they don't they don't say what happens to him he might have raped her but either way it was she is not interested in him yet uh this girl fuck hold on i am so shit with names uh the girl lace is super jealous of Maggie and, and the head of the Dagger gang. So she's kind of against Maggie right from the beginning, even though Maggie has, like, made her, like, a central figure in her new girl gang, and she she really likes Lace. Yeah, it's a fun little movie. Uh, in comparison to other, like, Youth and Revolt movies... Of like the, I always felt like like the youth and revolt stuff. It sort of starts in like the fifties, and I I always feel like so many of these movies are so tame. It's like, come on, I want to see kids do bad things. Go get out there, be reckless, be terrible, and they're always just sort of like sitting around drinking beer and and. 
like threatening people, but never doing anything, never never crossing that line. And to be fair, for a little while they had the Haze Code to deal with, but even once you started getting into like like the MPAA era, there were just so many movies where it's just like, yeah, we're like the rebellious kids. And then they never do anything. And I I would... I, I do wish there was a little more of an edge to Switchblade Sisters. No pun intended. But I, I feel like it fulfills a lot more than what similar movies were doing. Like, it wasn't afraid to make its characters, like, unabashedly evil, unabashedly, like fuck everything, we're just, we're, we're in this for ourselves, you know, youth in revolt, let's fuck shit up. That's the type of movie I want to see. I want to see people fucking shit up. It's also, uh, kind of, kind of aimless, I guess, kind of, maybe aimless is the wrong word. It, it doesn't follow the conventional three-act structure, it's just sort of, this thing happens, and then this thing happens, and then this thing happens, and then this thing happens. Not quite episodic, but like, it's it's not, it's not a solid narrative. Like, there's two different scenes that are sort of the climax, but neither of them really are the climax. So there's like a big shootout between the Jezebels and uh, the rival gang they're trying to take down. But then there's also a fight between Maggie and Lace. And Maggie and Lace feels emotionally like it should be the climax. But there's like way more stuff going on in this gang war. Which happens like a scene earlier. And so it's like... <sighs> you've got two climaxes here. Put one of them earlier in the movie... Or, like, make them all one thing. You know, one flows into the other a little better. I don't know, it's just it, it oddly structured film. But uh, a fun one. One I really enjoyed. It, it has its problems, for sure. For sure it has its problems. But, you know, uh, not the worst thing in the world. Uh, directed by Jack Hill, who... Uh, sort of a... He did a lot of exploitation, and he kind of worked in, like, all types of exploitation. It's like, whatever you got, I'm gonna do it. You know, all of the types of exploitation. He kind of uh, discovered Pam Greer. He was the first one to make Pam Greer move, make, make Pam Greer a big star in his movies. He made Coffee and uh, Foxy Brown. Um... And there's a little, there's like a taste of that black exploitation that he made in this film. Because when the Jezebels want to take down this rival gang, they go across town and find this gang of black girls. Like, this like, radical Black Panthers type group. And weirdly, the, the way she entices them into helping them fight... This rifle gang is like, oh, they've got guns, and uh, we'll let you have all of their guns. You know, you guys, you know, you love guns. You want some more guns? But it seems like they have a lot of guns. Like, they have enough to arm themselves and all of the Jezebels. So, I kind of feel like they don't need that much more firepower. Like, at the point where... Each of your members could have two guns. Like, we're not talking, like, handguns. We're talking, like, big ol' AKs, you know, uh, uh, AR-15s. Like, at the point where each of your members could have two of these, you don't need more guns. It just, it seems like a really weak setup to get them involved in this story. They're also not very well established in the first act. That's kind of what I'm talking about with, like, the weird structure. It's just like, oh, how are we going to defeat these guys? Uh, we'll get help from this black gang that we've never mentioned before, but, like, we, we can get them to be with us. No worries. Like, they haven't shown up at all in this plot, 
but they're gonna help us. The uh, the leader of the rival gang is a guy named Krabs. That's his nickname, at least. His nickname is Krabs. And uh, as, like, initiation, they challenge Maggie to go, like, get this medallion he wears. And she gets, you know, like, flirty with them, you know, trying to, like, you know, get close to him. Like, ooh, we're, we should do the sex just to, like, get close enough to snatch that thing and run. And I'm sitting there like, you should not fuck a dude whose nickname is Krabs. That's just bad vibes. Do not fuck guys named Krabs. Uh, Switchblade Sisters. Bit of an odd title, bit of a not super fitting title. The original title was The Jezebels. And it, it played a bunch of uh, drive-ins as The Jezebels and... It just didn't do well. It didn't do well anywhere it went. And there a lot of those theaters were like, it's the title. People don't want to watch a movie called The Jezebel. They don't that doesn't sound like an exciting exploitation film. So they're like, alright, we're gonna change the title. We're gonna call it Switchblade Sisters. But they still had one venue left where they had to play it under the title The Jezebels. And it did really well at the last theater it played as Jezebels. And then it never really did well as Switchblade Sisters either, so... <laughs> Seems like it was more the movie than the title, but... Uh, Switchblade Sisters, it's... You have to have a very specific taste in exploitation to, to enjoy this one that much, but I don't think it's bad. I think it's pretty enjoyable. Um, it's just, you know, it's, it's for a very specific audience that I am in, but it, it might not be everyone's thing. Uh, and then finally there was Detroit 9000, which sounds kind of sci-fi-y. Like, Detroit 9000 sounds like it should be, like, a RoboCop ripoff or something, but it's not. It's, it's just like a normal, it's, it's not sci-fi, it's just... Like a normal police procedural black exploitation film. The, the the reason it's called Detroit 9000 is because 9000 was like police code for like Officer Down in the 70s. Apparently they had phased it out by like the early 80s. So the title doesn't even really make sense anymore. But in the 70s, it, it, the title effectively is Detroit officer down you know that's and yeah some police officers get downed in this movie quite a lot actually the detroit 9000 it starts with uh the, this you know this black politician and he's he's gonna run for governor he's gonna be our first black governor in this country because you know it's the 70s this is like 72 so he's gonna be the first black governor and he has this big you know, charity event and like everyone donates to to me so that I can become our first black uh, governor. But then these mass bandits come in. They hold the place up. They take all of this, uh, all all the donation money and run out with it. So it's up to this uh, white police officer, uh, Danny, and this black private detective named uh jesse sergeant jesse williams who's like a former football player in the, the context of the story um they they get paired up to figure out who pulled off this heist and there's like all this speculation and, and like people asking questions like oh was this you know were black people ripping off other black people or was this like an attempt by white people to like keep the, the black man down, you know, keep, keep the black governor from getting what he wants. And the whole time I'm like, it's probably just people who want money. Like, I, this doesn't see, it didn't seem that racially motivated at all. It could just be people who wanted money. Spoilers, it's just people who wanted money. <laughs> and in fact, they, they make a very deliberate point that like, Everyone involved on this job, there there were like, it was, it was a very diverse group of people, racially diverse group of people. 
you know, it, it was headed up by, like, these two black guys, but then there, there were, like, white guys on the team, and then the, there was an Indian involved, or a Native American, I guess. Uh, they say they say Indian, but then they're talking about, like, Native American stuff about re- regarding him, so I assume they mean Native American and not, like, India Indian. Yeah, so they... These two cops are now on this job, and, like, any time they get close to a lead, the lead ends up dead, you know? Any, like, they, they've tracked a suspect, the suspect gets shot, they, they, you know, they've got someone who has information, and by the time they get there to get the information, that guy's dead, and it's just, like, they, they can't get any headway on this case. Uh, I might have said this previously when I did, like, a black exploitation triple feature... Um, a lot of black exploitation films are just, like, not really my thing. Some of them are. There's some really good ones. But a lot of them, I feel, are pretty dull. Especially the ones about fucking cops. Like, I just... I don't care. Like, and it's... Like, on the one hand, there's there's the part of me that's like, Oh, uh, yeah, you know, I want... I want the radical black man. I want the... the wild black exploitation film, you know? The shit the Black Panthers would want you to watch. I want sweet, sweet back, you know? But it's like, even ignoring that, like, there's black exploitation movies about cops I like. I like Shaft. Who doesn't like Shaft? It's so good. But <laughs> a lot of them just end up feeling like boring police procedurals. But it's a black police procedural, and it's like, Still boring, <laughs> you know. I mean, I say still boring. It, more like it's hit or miss the same way any cop film would be. Just happens that the lead is black. That I, I don't really like the... It's just a cop movie except the main character is black. Not into those types of films. I, I will say uh, for... For one of those movies, Detroit 9000, it's definitely very punchy, you know, fast-paced. There's a lot of good action. So I, I can't say it's, like, the worst of its kind. It's it's pretty entertaining. I, it held my interest enough. Um, I probably won't revisit it, whereas I'm, I will definitely be revisiting Mighty Peking Man. This is my second time watching it. And I'll probably rewatch Switchblade Sisters, too. Yeah, Detroit 9000. Maybe it'll be someone's thing, but it's not really my thing. It's okay. It's fun. It has its moments. But I mean, even like, like I thought they had a funny ending. Like, I, I laughed and I'm like, ha what a great way to end it. And then it just keeps going for like another 10 minutes. And I'm like, oh, oh, it wasn't a funny ending. They, they, were, they kept going with this. Jeez, boy, that's fun. Yeah, Detroit 9000. Maybe if you're into, like, 70s cop movies, you'll like it, but... Eh, it wasn't my thing. Since this was, somewhat inadvertently, uh, curated by Quentin Tarantino, obviously Quentin Tarantino did not come to me personally and say, like, hey, talk about these three movies. I just bought a DVD that he curated... So, I mean, if you want to if you want to get technical, I also did uh the American American Horror Project Volume 1 from Arrow Video. You could argue that was equally guest curated cuz I just showed three movies that came in a triple feature together. But anyways, uh I asked last time who you would like to guest curate an episode, and I would definitely like to hit up some of my friends, some uh, like, Twitter mutuals, and get get some of them to, like, recommend a triple feature sometime. Um, I think that'd be fun. Uh, I, I asked last time who you would get to curate a triple feature for, for Matt Presents. I'm feeling, like, Frank Hannenlauter. Frank Hannenlauter's seen a lot of exploitation movies, like, Oh, man, the man knows his stuff. I'll say that much. Um, 
John Waters, I think, would also be an interesting pick. John, John Waters has recommended some very interesting films. I had an answer here from Lino. Lino says, Sam Raimi or Argento? Presumably Dario Argento. Um, I don't know that much about like the types of films Dario Argento watches. In fact, offhand, I might, I might pick Luigi Cazzi over Dario Argento, because Cazzi knows his goddamn shit, man. Like, Kazi has written, like, books and books on Italian cinema. So, I, I might go Kazi over Argento. But uh, Sam Raimi definitely sounds like an interesting one. Sam Raimi definitely knows his shit. Um, if you'll stick around, next week's triple feature has a Sam Raimi movie in it. So, look forward to that. Anyways, in celebration of the conclusion of my first year of movie nights, my question this year is just... Or my question this week... This year? What the fuck? This week. My question this week is... Uh, what was your favorite movie I talked about in the first year of Matt Presents? Um, I don't know how closely people have been keeping up. I'm pretty confident no one has watched every single movie I've recommended. If you have, sound off in the comments, but, uh, just let, you know, which one of these, uh, was your favorite? If you watched any, which one did I recommend that you enjoyed, you know? Let, let me know about that. I, I definitely want to know, like, both, like, if, if I recommended a movie you already really loved, you can say that, too. But I, I want to know what movies people have, like, discovered that I recommended. It's been a little while since we had just, like, a grab bag triple feature. So there's no connective tissue to these three movies. It's just, I mean, they're all horror, I guess. But even then, they seem like very different types of horror. So three unrelated horror movies. Starting, of course, with the original Godzilla. I've been putting it, off, putting it off long enough. Gotta show it. You gotta show Godzilla. I said we're gonna watch the classics this year. We're gonna talk about Godzilla. That one's been coming since I recommended Mothra. So, Godzilla. And look forward to more Godzilla movies in the future. Um, after that, we're gonna watch The Incredible Shrinking Man, which is just in this sci-fi box set. Um, not the first time I've pulled out this sci-fi box set. It's also got Tarantula on there. Yeah, The Incredible Shrinking Man, second feature. And we're going to end with The God Monster of Indian Flats. Uh, a, a something weird American genre film archive release. They've even, you know, speaking of Frank Henenlotter, they have them quoted on the back of the box, so... There it is. Uh, just random grab bag triple feature for next time. Until then, have a nice day.